Hello everyone. Today we talk about banking in late medieval Europe. It's going to be a reflection, rather not particularly uh, in depth uh, on the topic, but considering certain aspects of it. Um, f first one, starting from the crisis of the mid and early, actually 14th century, right? This big crack that. Uh, actually happened before even Black Death and the contraction, even the, the economical demographic contraction that he followed, right? And that definitely brought down with them a lot of um, a lot of investors that were actually the majority of those who invested in great companies. We're talking about essentially the great Italian banks, like the so-called Lombard, and as were uh, they also contain actually Tuscan that were also the most preeminent in that regard uh, bankers uh, all uh, companies that had been born mm, telling the truth even very recently that's a very interesting part of the story actually talking specifically even about Tuscan banking right Lombard banking was very uh, fairly old you know it was already active in the 12th century prominently in almost all of Europe Western Europe and um, but it was the Tuscans that fundamentally from the mid 13th century had um, made an enormous wealth an enormous fortune thanks chiefly um, to and this is true especially for Florence and Siena right um, for essentially financing by financing the Angevin crusade in southern Italy Right, and basically, when the the Angevins, the the Anjou, uh, conquer uh, what was the kingdom of Sicily, uh, that eventually would lose a part of, so best known as Naples, also because they shifted the capital to Naples, uh, they started to um, essentially uh, they were rewarded mm -hmm. with the monopoly on grain um, supply and distribution from central Italy. Central Italy at this point, especially Sicily, was this immense amount of grain uh, production that historically speaking had always kind of fed the Italian peninsula and even beyond in, in the Middle Ages, as you know, Europe basically um, stops being fed with uh, North African grain, it's it's the other way around, like the especially the southern European areas starts ex exporting grain even in places like Egypt, right, <laughs> it was more, uh, renowned with one of the most fertile and productive areas in previous centuries. So this gives you a dimension of the fact that if you owned a monopoly on those assets, you made an enormous money. And this explains in part, I don't know, the rise of Florence and humanism in the Renaissance, because uh, it stemmed from there, right? Uh, these were companies that had developed extremely fast, right? And there was a lot of capitalistic equilibrism in this, right? Because what, what they were doing was fine, it was done pretty well. But uh, before the crisis of, of the early 14th century, actually nobody at the time had developed systems to kind of absorb eventual um, failures, collapses, right? Um, major break breakdowns uh, of the system. Very often, I think even on Schwerpunkt, we, we said at one point that um, this, the, the great crisis of the 14th century passed even through the fact that objectively um, the enormous loans that the Lombards made to the English, to the French, uh, and also to other Italians, telling the truth, because, you know, these things, you have to think, um, I mean, let's finishing the phrase, ha had caused the, the the collapse right this is not entirely true right of course um, major mm, conflicts that broke out between England and France had mm, significant impact like uh, crowns at the time were chronically uh, in debt uh, without cash they needed to cash fast right and this was a time in history in which there wasn't no um, you know standardized saddle tax collection therefore what do you see you know for Philip the fourth uh, France, you start, you know, um, slaughtering the Templars and seizing all their enormous amount of assets. You start, in fact, uh, robbing the same Lombard and Jewish merchants and to, to sack them. Um, you, s you start invading Flanders because, hey, that's uh, in the area, some of the, the most, ver uh, you know, was some of the wealthiest areas where you want to seize their trade, etc. You know, major uh, war breaks out. These are systems that will continue like this, like squeezing the local resources uh, up to the early modern age, right? It's not before the 17th century that you have 
uh, efficient uh, efficient tax systems that can effectively fuel satisfactorily um, the statal uh, needs, especially in, term, in terms of the military, right? Because the you, the big problem here, the, all the greatest expenses, as we've recalled many times, was about war, like having an, an army on the field. So that that's literally what it was. And there weren't any any other ways to to enforce levies and so on. You know, it simply didn't have the central authority at the time to to achieve this. And definitely wars and, and etc. Like they fueled the thing. Like these bankers would keep paying for like loaning and sometimes getting rewarded with uh, in fact as we've seen in the case of Sicily with natural assets right this was c this would continue on usually uh, they the, the kingdoms subcontracted mines for example another very remunerative uh, business that these bankers be that had began essentially as money lenders and very modestly so um, to seize uh, also many sectors of production, right, that they had to manage in turn, like admi as administrators, um, in um, in ways that were expanding in this sense a, a larger um, administrative system, managing system, say, uh, in the in the market uh, and in, in the economy of Europe. Um, so we can say that by the end of the 13th and beginning of 14th century, so when basically stagnation, when not rece often recession, starts happening, uh, this system starts um, starts failing progressively. So of course it is true that uh, some of the failures of major Tosco Tosco Angevin um, banks was related in part even to the insolvency of uh, the English crown, the, the French crowns, etc. But the truth is that their system was sensibly weakened and that these um, major losses caused a domino effect that in turn caused a, a, you know, a massive crisis that revealed actually the, the lack of system, you know, support that the systems had. Because as we were saying before, these were, you know, uh, it was all private investors that at the time could opt, usually did or always opt between, you know, investing in uh, banking, uh, this early banking, and uh, and the land, right? And it's obvious that at the beginning, especially certain banks were making a huge fortune with high taxes of interest, so this called, like, very, um, a lot, they drew a lot of uh, capital as such. Eventually, with the major collapse of the world system in the mid 14th century, you have a coming back on the land, on the real concrete asset that at this time was was always so, right? Um, and uh, this is important to stress because it's obvious that th there was no thing like the, the major sector of production of wealth and w was the land. Point. It was all about agriculture, like in any pre-industrial system. But this was a big blow because essentially uh, the people who had invested in these activities, um, I mean, it was a pretty international blow because those who had invested in these activities, in fact, were the middle classes, right? Uh, very often the urban centers that were the ones in charge actually of supply distribution all over Europe. Okay, let's not exaggerate. It's not before the 16th century that there are, you know, major established direct, um, let's say, economical dependencies like, I don't know, the, the Russian grain that was exported in England or in Portugal and on which, the you know, the system that starts relying on a truly internationalized market um, and, and beyond, like the major crisis, I don't know, to, to during the uh, 17th century. Uh, uh, Holland, right? Um, but that that's another story. Um, this is kind of different, um, but at the same time it hits objectively those areas that had kind of catalyzed most of this major growth uh, in the previous centuries and bring to a restructuration of fields of investment and as a consequence of political and social directions. All right. Um, what the uh, all this banking and practice had um, uh, left as a legacy, however, was very important for further developments. As we've seen many times on Schwerpunkt, medieval civilization didn't quite collapse, did it? Like, uh, 6th century major pandemics, the late antique world effectively dies out, like it transforms in many ways but it it, 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 it shrinks and it, it has to restart with great difficulty for, for centuries. 14th century Europe is nothing like that. 
they're hit by major pandemics. Uh, they lost uh, an enormous part of the population, but this thing goes on, right? This is something you can't find even in the Chronicles, etc. The, the mindset didn't didn't um, you know didn't contemplate that that was the end of the world for real. Um, that 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 there had even been a major shift. Now t today we we know, of course, historiographically speaking, that the mid 14th century is a moment of tremendous. Uh, modification of many um, of the system etc but uh, just like today I would say uh, under certain points of view you know, there are massive changes that we don't even realize right you know how did our life effectively seems to have changed dramatically in the last 30 years like more or less we feel like it's the same even if we realize that I don't know the internet has changed everything that, that now we can do things that I don't know 40 years ago we wouldn't even dream of um, but um, do we didn't expect all the right? But what 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 I mean is that things do have to have changed for real, and are keeping changing. Well, at the time the thing went on, right? They they s they m they effectively managed to to make the treasure what they had developed in the last decades. That had what was pretty impressive for the time, right? Definitely had changed the mindset. Um, generationally speaking, um, and it was bringing towards another direction. Today we don't talk specifically about that, but we want to remember the, for example, the progress achieved in the field of accounting and bookkeeping. Um, for example, the Arab numbers now was were in, mm, used with ever greater frequency. Um, the mm, the system of the, I mean, the double entry method was taking root, right, uh, this computistic technique that is based on this double registration, right, of the depths of the credits of every um, operation that's being carried out. Um, that is in reference, and inter uh, interestingly enough, both to the people and the products, like in previous centuries normally, um, and this is how the same things had began, um, prehistorically speaking, let's say, you know, th there was a guy that had a ship, I don't know, and uh, he was about that, he had been training maybe uh, for generations, and there were other rich um, middle class uh, individuals, or even noblemen, that invested in it, and made a contract, and they say, okay, uh, here there is a rate of interest, and we share the profits, things goes well, fine, it was like una tantum, right, it was just one by one, then eventually these things had developed in real systems, and therefore, uh, just just think about the volume of the traffics, right? All this stuff is developed uh, in Italy for the simple reason that the Italians were literally shifting the wall, almost like all the the um, all the things that were imported and exported from Europe to Asia to North Africa, and and therefore you realize that they needed forcefully to develop these accounting practices that previously were fundamentally unknown and that in capitalistic terms are of extreme importance because they're essentially s the things that we still use today, right? Double entry method is something you you, you learn when you want to be a, an economist, uh, commercialist, mm, uh, etc. They're born now, right? Because they have to control this enormous, enormous, unprecedented, unprecedented amount of traffic, that uh, volume of traffic that uh, not even the Roman Empire had uh, been there practically. Um, a completely different dimension. Th there is no comparison between the economical potential of, I don't know, uh, this point, 13, for, uh, 13th century Europe and the one of the Roman Empire. In term trade terms, th there is no way to do that. And part of the reason is thanks to the same fragmentation of Europe, as we have repeated many times, because um, it was, uh, but there were other reasons, objectively. But still, this fragmentation um, yeah, it, it it kind of um, produced instability in some way, but on the other, it st it, it forms antibodies uh, for better organization, better administration, and um, calculation of uh, of the risk, and therefore of a b more refined um, economical mm, predictions and and consequent actions, etc. So it's all very very important. We're talking about in this registers being recorded literally everything loans exchanges uh, and that that also start being developed here 
um, paper money is being is, is starting being used here in the sense I don't need to you know shift gold uh, in tons of you know of, of money uh, from here and there in Europe because these guys had branches literally everywhere in Europe um, you know think about what communications were I mean mortiers thieves and and so on and you know simple local nobles wanted to seize what the merchants brought so they start using paper money which is ever more effective so that at the end of the day and that's what the double entry method w was stamped from because you know they, they simply exchanged paper to make this difference and eventually they had to transport only the um, the payment that they um, that resulted from this transaction right they didn't have to travel with all all the money uh, by themselves and the brand uh, uh, yeah and the, the branches were uh, on the same exact philosophy and we'll see now the fact that of course you know ev every branch was even a kind of a, a of a business on its own and if that part failed you know there was still the broader uh, company that uh, allowed you to um, uh, you know to um, to be refunded but also to um, that that you had effectively your own administration there, and you need you didn't need now uh, to go back in the founding city where all this thing had begun, and you worked from there, right? And and this naturally involved uh, a major amount of traffic, so weren't just of you know the the place of origin, but also the all the people that worked for these companies as well. Um, so you understand how big actually this uh, system was, and that's. And that's why that those uh, financial cracks were actually so heavy at the time. Um, um, the administrative books were diversified uh, with the annotation of the daily transactions and with the registration of gains of the profits of business partners mm -hmm. that were in this sense separated at that point were recalculated time by time. Um, also, the cash register situation, right? Um, the 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 gains and the profits of 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 the company and of the partners were recorded in the journal, and the second and the latter, the I mean, the cash register situation in the great books of accounting. Um, so the mid 14th century. Mm, presents this change uh, for which the associative forms begin to be more complex right um, it, it's here that the company with branches um, uh, is is transformed like uh, the, the company is a unique legal entity and this passes into the controlled uh, company right that is always controlled by one or more families like it had always been at this point but comprehending however more corporate juridically uh, autonomous corporate units right um, in this way the eventual failure of a branch didn't have uh, would have not overwhelmed the whole organization and the business partners would have been responsible only for the quotas that they possessed uh, in the enterprise that would would have eventually failed hmm? and this was a way essentially to cope with the massive crack that had existed because this um, capacity of covering the losses right in trying to contain them and sectorial sectorialize them and kind of avoiding in, in the, the, the market collapse also um, was um, you know was solved in, in this way. In, I mean, solved. I mean, of course, there were major cracks uh, at the same time at one point, but there were better ways of absorbing them in, in some way. Uh, and this starts happening really mm, uh, everywhere, like because this was a great mercantile model that, as we have seen, had been developed in central northern Italy between the 13th and the 14th century. It is after the crisis. This spreads. Um, importantly, um, in other areas of Europe, that um, so in, in all those mm, situations where groups of merchants, of businessmen, etc., wanted to dedicate to trade and financial operations, um, this in turn causes a major uh, change of sort. For, first of all, there were actually many factors. There is the shift, the the decline, if you want, of the same 
um, Italian mercantile predominion that happened for many reasons, right? Both environmental, both politi um, political, and, and and other factors that are important. First of all, Italy was one of uh, the regions that had been hit the hardest by the um, by the epidemics, and that uh, therefore th this didn't fit pretty well, right? Especially because Italy was all politically divided, and therefore it was not just like a unique mm, country. Um, governed by a unitary direction that could more or less absorb the blow and still operate uh, individually as um, you know maybe weakened but still with, with, a, with a unitary direction. So all these city states um, so their mm, their economical preeminence right really mentioned by the same problems that this shrinking had brought them back to as uh, effectively giants would but with financial giants, but with fundamentally limited bases. Think about Florence, that at this point is literally the uh, richest city in the world. Um, it has a greater income than the whole kingdom of England, but it's not even a regional power. I mean, it's just its uh, district and try and even you know suffering substantial defeats uh, from its neighbors, right? So it's a sort of paradox, and this tells you why effectively that even business model had failed, all right? Um, and how this needed to change. Uh, we all know about the Medici in the 15th century, but and th these pe people had an enormous power, that had an enormous political weight all over Europe. They were courted by all the, the kings, that they, they became royalty by themselves because they had an enormous amount of money. Actually concentrated all in the single hands of the family, which had never happened. The, the Medici were literally the, the wealthiest people there ever existed. But Florence in itself as a system, as a republic, was never as rich as it has been in absolute terms in the for in the 14th century, in the previous century at that point. Um, this is important because even the same Italian um, uh, regional states that have been born, let's say provincial states, um, the, um, the, the mean, uh, there was a um, coming back to the structuration of, of a territorial dominion rather than creating a financial empire. Um, there been also the rise of um, of Aragon that had uh, kind of um, uh, started challenging the Italians in the Mediterranean, never managed to actually take him out, but essentially was an important competitor. Um, Venice had kind of monopolized most of the eastern uh, Mediterranean traffics, uh, which means that Genoa in part had been um, resized there and they opened the Atlantic routes that in turn favored the Iberian ports. Um, so that's where f from 14th century, 15th century, ironically with largely Italian crews, uh, the kingdoms of Portugal and eventually of Castile will start their, um, you know, the, their geographical explorations uh, in the Atlantic and therefore opening new routes that would shift the main traffic from the Mediterranean into the uh, the rest of you know outside of um, of of the same Europe at that point this is very important because also in the 16th century you find that for example the Ottomans and the Venetians clash against each other but and and they are you know respectively a uh, Muslim and a Christian power and they have conflicting uh, interest and whatever, but the, uh, the, the the Iberian routes that were opened, uh, you know, around Africa to India. They, now they were damaging essentially both, and um, what they both lived of as powers placed where they were, the place they were. Um, they they th that was a major loss for the both of them, and, and therefore at some point they even had to stop fighting and kind of trading once again because of letting in the first place. Those those trade flows from Europe to Asia actually open by, uh, via land, right? Um, there were other um, reasons for for this decline. There was also the structuration of other European powers. Like uh, the fourteenth century was a pretty tough moment, as we know, for France. But if you think about it, um, this system would fundamentally in the fifteenth century, the second half, regain its uh, enormous. Uh, prestige, unity, and power it would become the, the largest power in Western Europe, and in fact, even starting the Italian wars, it literally invading uh, Italy with a military might that at th that point, you know, basically all of Europe had to put put, put together to to contrast um, the mm, 
the, there was the development of certain areas, especially of Central Europe, that up to uh, the, the low Middle Ages had objectively remained lagged behind. But we're talking especially about Germany, and especially Southern Germany, that had at this point a financial uh, as well as minerary um, development. It, w it was really amazing that, by the way, favored even more those land routes that took away further maybe they favored Venice specifically that had strong contacts uh, contacts with Bavaria and uh, with Central Europe but let's say that that uh, landway uh, kind of created a crisis also for other Italian routes that passed elsewhere uh, another area that suffered enormously in this phase was southern France southern France had been essentially in during the uh, the 11th to the 13th century, one of the major routes with the Rhone Valley for all the exports from Tuscany, for example, up to the Rhone Valley to the Champagne fairs and the uh, Flemish markets, uh, Flemish cities, and the um, and the English market of wool. Um, so it had enjoyed an enormous, but at this point, the rates, uh, the trade, uh, the routes shift the Venetians towards uh, via land towards Germany, the Genoese. Uh, basically uh, through the Gibraltar Strait to, to um, England. So basically Southern France gets bypassed and this once, you know, very important cities that would remain so generally also as demic centers like think about Marseille, uh, uh, Toulouse, um, etc. But they th this would eventually decline with the, the greater expansion of, of Northern France that instead was the, you know, also the closest to the, to the actual center of power of the monarchy. Um, the same German states began, as in spite of the frag relative fragmentation of Germany after the uh, end of the Orange Stuff, began to compact their dominions, began to structure their uh, certain principalities, essentially. We're talking about the Habsburgs, about uh, the, uh, the Wittelsbach, uh, the uh, Hohenzollern, and the Wettins, etc., uh, some of which would decline, uh, others would structurate further, but there is this um, progressive and sounder control, especially, and I want to insist on this, I made a video that is called Territorial Compaction of Medieval Europe, I think, it was from, from more than one year ago, but that talks about it well, because it's kind of a list of all those uh, territorial entities that began after the 14th century, paradoxically, not to disrupt themselves further, and that's the greatness of the resilience of medieval civilization, but to actually structure themselves a more sound, especially safer basis, even in capitalistic terms, right? And in fact, the Renaissance in part is being interpreted as well as essentially this capacity of the Europeans to channel and, and stock their resources in all these various um, sectorialized um, uh, fields, like, uh, let's say, uh, boundaries that every uh, each one of these small states actually embodied that knew better how to invest its money and that even in case of events like, I don't know, the Ottoman advance, for example, that swallowed the entire Balkans, etc., managed to shift part of its wealth towards other areas as a sort of layered um, frontier that could effectively save through this at this point, European-wide interaction, all the various investments, etc., and all the system of the branches it wa w was very important for this reason uh, as well. So this was actually a, a, a victorious model, if you think about it commercially, right? The uh, great part of our society is literally economy, right? It's like the, the problem that we're facing today, when there is a major... Um, you know, economical crisis, the, the, the problem is literally how do you make things work? And this is not a rhetorical question. Um, and, and that's why this, the, the, this system of Europe that had risen so fast, like in the last two or three centuries, or even more, um, but dramatically, especially in the last two, um, albeit showing this initial, uh, you know, in preparation, towards the crisis, managed to find other ways and to readapt itself and to centralize and to compact. And in fact, the, the very instability that was caused by the crisis brought to this further compaction. There was a kind of a consensual response, even politically, socially speaking, to the idea that, for example, there had to be a more centralized rule. 
right? Nobody apparently likes this because, say, I don't want to be uh, to lose my freedom. But at a certain point, you know, you must, if anything, to survive, remain uh, remain under a a guide of some sort that can provide you for food, stability, an army, right? Um, this don't don't exclude war also as a major element of decline, even of certain realities. I mean, uh, there are systems that what you've seen, uh, you seen, you can't really see why the 14th century crisis was triggered by, right? Was it uh, just, I don't know, a uh, health problem uh, because of the plague and whatever? Um, was a, was a, um, like, I, I think I'm studying specifically this this phase, and I, I believe war was a major factor here. I mean, the, the, the Europe uh, in the 13th century was this hypersynetic system that began to burn its energies, basically, you know, struggling, fighting, and this produced, unavoidably, a massive um, need for political and social restructuration on models that were essentially monarchical, if you want, um, or at least princely in some form, I mean, with the idea of a unique uh, leader. This is something you find everywhere, right? You find it uh, in England, after all, um, you find it in, in France, you find it in Germany, and you find it in Italy. There is all um, kind of a principalization of power, of dynastization of power, of framing of communities within a um, political military control that is literally territorial based. It's not like the free uh, city-states, the, the independent lords that do whatever they do in this kind of fluid mm, and, um, uh, let's say, centerless um, gravityless um, world, right? At this point, there is a compaction, and this compaction works. And the reason why it happens in the first place is that it worked because people said, "Okay, we are tired, for example, of fighting. We don't want to go to war anymore. We will pay mercenaries that are military professionals, and this cost, and because they they, they need, you know, professionals do cost whatever it is, their experience, their quality, their weapons." Uh, technology is, is doing its part. Uh, do not underestimate the impact of artillery, for example, in um, the need of a more centralized direction. This is, in a nutshell, what I don't know, the Parker wrote for the modern age, but even exaggerating with the term of revolution. Um, but this this had started sin ever since I don't know trebuchet uh, trebuchet were around, right? If you uh, have now, if it's easier to take down castles and stuff, and you you know, local communities by themselves do not have enough power to 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 build something now that can withstand uh, armies and their technol and the technology they use. You know, you need someone else from the above that, that needs to to invest larger amounts of money to build something kind of di you know rationally thought as a major fortress in a strategic, particularly uh, strategic position that will hopefully stop larger armies, etc. This needs coordination, this, need, this needs an administration, people who know how to regulate things and to... Um, and th this, this needs uh, taxes being paid, etc. So, uh, yeah, it, it, as always, the this is always when it gets controversial. Loss of freedom, but paradoxically we got better through that in part, and that triggered more wealth and therefore more people fighting for their freedom, uh, more people fighting for their freedom once again, right? It sounds paradoxical, but it is as it is, and overall, especially, I think, in European history, this progress is quite evident, right? But it's valid also for other for other areas, for other contexts. Um, so, mm, the um, with the Italian decline, the, the Italian mercantile decline in Europe, uh, we uh, see the affirmation of societies that will soon would soon reach um, remarkable dimensions. Right, we're talking especially about some Swiss and German societies. For example, the great commercial society of Ravensburg in Swabia. Uh, that was, um, in fact, it, it rose in the last uh, years of the 14th century and lasted up to the 15 uh, to 1530. That was specialized specifically in the exports of fustain and of the linen produced in southern Germany, mm, and for the other side, in the import of Spanish sugar and saffron uh, 
uh, with branches scattered all over Europe. Right. Another time we will talk about, especially also the, the merchants of the Anseatic League, that however is something a bit more particular than this. Um, they're, they're not comparable and also their development was kind of... Um, uh, kind of also... okay, well, not, let's not bring it too far. But just think also at uh, how fundamentally these um, companies will become the same engine sometimes and same fuel say better of the um, of the great powers of of the of 15th century Europe right think about the Fuga right and their importance they would have in the early modern age to fund uh, the the Habsburg Empire um, they failed, right? This, these guys had been paid with mines, etc. They had made their fortune from Augsburg. They were, you know, very well. They go bankrupt at that point because really they, they were the loans they had made to, to Spain weren't paid anymore, right? So Spain passes once again actually to the Italians, to the Bank of St. George in Genoa, and that lasts again. And it fails as well <laughs> because so basically all the the campaigns of Flanders, the Eighty Years' War was funded by the Genoese, and that, as we know, went pretty badly for the Spanish uh, on the long run. And um, so th these are major resources that actually wear out the systems. Like, consider this, that there is a, a, an amazing amount of wealth that was capitalized at one point, and that uh, at one point gets burned because there are other competitive markets that manage to draw resources and to make a fortune through other ways and therefore at one point one system uh, basically doesn't have the capacity to replenish and to uh, to you know to have the means the assets to even to think to to compete right with those other powers and that's in a nutshell the uh, many ways uh, think about uh, we're as we were saying before the great ad advancements of you know the importance of the Atlantic routes. Um, the Atlantic routes will trigger in the 16th century a another very interesting phenomenon, even at a level of provincial administration and centralization of s uh, of um, of monarchies. Actually, the, the best example is France, right, with this major ports that were specialized even in slave trade and things like this uh, think about Bordeaux, uh, Rouen, uh, other um, centers that had um, this that, that w began as cities uh, as mm, port cities uh, to be detached ever more from the countryside. This is another important aspect of the story right as we were saying before there would be other major cracks in the during the modern age but I it's interesting that european cities overall tend to form uh tanks even to uh, the expansion of uh, of european routes outside the con the old continent um this kind of connective tissue that is ever more dependent of international markets in in this sense in turn ever more detached from the countryside. This is important because in parallel you also have a loss uh, of political and social uh, weight of the peasantry. We have made several videos talking about the decline of peasantry actually in, in the late modern age, or, uh, excuse me, in the late middle ages, where the, the were seriously a, a much worse time to be a peasant than you know the high middle ages or the early middle ages, right, and that opens to the ancien regime and this phase of you know ever greater exploitation that eventually will explode in this major things like the French Revolution etc um, but that's also a bit more complicated there are always the middle classes in the middle that make this revolutions available actually even in the same 14th century like the Jacquerie and other uh, revolts in other cities are actually uh, it's it's never just the peasants. They, the peasants are always led by someone. It's neither noblemen or middle class, uh, you know, the bourgeoisie, uh, etc. So um, we okay, we made videos dedicated to that. So th there is no need to repeat these things now. But it, it's nevertheless important because what you see is that up to the sixth, the the advanced sixth century, even the banking and uh, uh, accounting practices and methods and even maths in that regard right do not have a sensible improvement um, but you know, the, the Europe had gone on essentially with what had been uh, 
um, discovered in the 13th and the 14th century. All right. Uh, but the same modern economic science, etc., uh, has its roots in the Middle Ages and in that moment. And essentially, uh, further improvements would always be on the base of these achievements, of these medieval achievements, even the modern age. Um, these transformations are, are very fascinating because, especially when you consider at the development of um, regions such as Central Europe, right? Um, you and this is when I, I I like to talk about the resilience of the medieval world because uh, think about I don't know a region like Germany historically speaking um, and uh, at the beginning of the Middle Ages and at the end of the Middle Ages essentially you pass from one of the most depressed areas in the continent to basically the most advanced technologically speaking together with Italy um, and in less than one thousand I, I don't know frankly any other area in the world that had this development to eventually to you know to expand further right um, the, the Middle Ages are a moment of massive structuration and of massive consolidation of European civilization in a way we we, we often uh, we dramatically overlook and and also of construction of a system that was interconnected like Europe was so deeply intertwined in its trade, in its culture. Um, think about humanism I and mean, what it really means. I mean, the, the true idea of a Europe, uh, even from a military point of view, think about Erasmus, it's, uh, it starts in, in this regard. Uh, the idea that there was a li it was a lingua franca, it was surely uh, Latin, but that at that point shared a broader dimension, broader models um, um, uh, that were in part elderly, but at the same time corresponded to shared needs, right? And thi this is all something that gives a great strength to the European culture and that allows it actually to, to expand outwards, right? In surely, uh, you know, expanding like every other power is done brutally and uh, thinking about gains, etc., not because of you know of charity etc but uh, still building effectively for further what also will be the grounds for for human rights for what we we consider now as international um, policy uh, and uh, etc that of course already existed before and that the middle ages contained effectively as such but that are in fact to expand the modern age that we consider as often something detached uh, from previous times that, that was effectively and largely essentially still the middle ages right you if you especially when you make a sharp when you detach the, the modern world from the contemporary world you can't avoid to see there that uh, on a broader scale and broader picture what you call the modern world that point that is ended by the french revolution it takes this long time when it depends in various areas of europe for french revolution to essentially 1918 it's not the modern age, it's literally the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages literally end in 1918. Um, it, it's a model, to me, th this is particularly evident, especially from a political and military point of view, right? because the Ancien Regime was really a political and juridical form. This exemplified itself in different forms um, of um, participation, even, even civically speaking, it was a different mindset, it was a different culture that we are losing, right? We, with, with, with the 20th century we have entered in the, uh, well that that's a product of French Revolution, but it kind of became standardized at one point of, of statalism. And uh, the, uh, the if statalism proper and then all what can derive from that in its deterior forms including uh, dictatorships, etc. Um, it, the, the concept is, uh, of course, mm, kind of more complex than this objectively. We are lucky to live in the world we live, but always remembering that there was also much we owe to that world that we have decided to forget, uh, like the Middle Ages, or, or even to stigmatize, like uh, the Dark Ages and so on, while actually that was the moment in which great part of our culture and our um, mindsets that still impart reason in that way, after all, were formed. Right. Uh, we could go on with other considerations, but um, I can't think now of a way to prosecute uh, pertinently this thing, but...
Um, okay, we can even stop it here. So for today, I think it's all. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.